Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Tech Done Different. As always, I am your host, Ted Harrington. And with me today, I have two special guests. So we're doing something special today that's going to be really, really fun. Instead of just one guest, we're having two. And we're going to have a really fun conversation about some of the issues related to women in security and, and how we can all, as an industry and as a community, continue to drive improvements in this area. So with me today, we have Jackie Lusto, the founder of the Australian Women in Security Network. Uh, Jackie, thank you for joining. Thank you for having me, Ted. Of course. And we have uh, Abby Swaby, the co-founder of Source to Create, as well as the publisher of the Women in Security magazine. So Abby, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So when I found out what you guys were all about and evangelizing, it was a no-brainer. I wanted to you know, have you on the show, certainly talking about um, these issues and, and how we can sort of advance the, the themes of diversity and inclusion and, and why those are important uh, to begin with. So um, I'll, I'll tee up the first question and then as each of you sort of chime in and we are reacting to each other, um, but maybe as you guys get started, Maybe you could just briefly introduce yourself and kind of your perspective and, um, and what you're working on. And what I'd, where I think we should start the discussion is talking about, um, I think we, at a human level, right, we, we all know that these ideas are important. We all, I don't think you need to teach anybody why diversity as a, as a human being or inclusion as a human being are important. But maybe we could talk about at a business level Maybe we could help explain to the audience why this matters to uh, the pragmatic sort of business perspective, in addition to it's, of course, uh, a human issue that should matter to us as humans. So uh, with that, yeah, whichever one of you guys want to take it away, introduce yourself, and let's start talking about that topic. Okay, I'll go first. So um, I, obviously, Ted, I reside in Australia, and I have done for over 20 years, originally from Bristol in the UK. Um, I basically, in 1996, scored my first media publishing house, uh, scored my first job in a media publishing house, and that's how everything started. So from then until 2019, I worked in several different media houses. Um, and then after that, I opened my own business, Source to Create, which is where I am now. We're a year old. Um, I love every single day um, and I haven't looked back. So um, with Source to Create, obviously with my business, we deliver different innovative, creative and engaging content to end users. But also I get to work with key associations like AWSN, the Australian Women in Security Network. I work with them on their annual Women in Security Awards. Um, of which we've gained huge momentum in for that event. Um, then we looked at the gaps, we worked out what was missing, and we found that there was no publication globally that actually catered for women in security and all walks of security. Um, there are lots of groups, associations, different events, but there was no publication. So we launched Women in Security, um, and I launched that in partnership with AWSM. So on that note, um, the reason why we launched Women in Security was to basically give men and women, actually, um, a new platform to discuss the new developments and perspectives and issues and progresses that are arising across diverse, when it comes to diversity. Um, we cover all different types of women in leadership, we hear inspirational stories from females in all types of security roles. Um, and we look at progression, hiring, coping with a non-diverse workforce. So this is very timely. Um, training and recruitment. So that, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Um, I launched the first issue on the 26th of February. So it's only been out nearly a week now. Um, it's pretty exciting. Thank you. And it looks Very great. Scary. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, I learned a few things when I launched it, that's for sure. And I've launched quite a few magazines in my lifetime. But this one was the scariest of them all, launching into an industry that um, 
ultimately everybody's looking at you when you talk about women insecurity. So it, it was very nerve wracking. But I have to say, being very humbling, received thousands of messages from men and women around the globe. Um, and the subscriptions went through the roof um, in the first couple of days. So apparently everybody loves it. So it's great to be on this show, to be able to talk about the different issues within pretty much the publication, literally. Um, yeah, so that's it. So, um, Jackie, I'll let you introduce yourself before we start answering the question. Thanks, Abby. So I've been in cybersecurity for almost two decades, well, more than two de decades. Um, I started off studying a Bachelor of Information Systems, um, started off as a Unix, a Unix administrator, was kind of like those, a, a techie person um, when I then moved to London to um, work over there as a security consultant. So I worked there for like seven years. Um, as a security consultant and then I um, moved over to Paris where I was a consultant as well and then I moved back to Australia and I remember going to one of my conferences and going okay where are all the women and um, I was really shocked by the fact that you know there weren't that so many women that are in the room and um, I, I kind of found another woman that was there and I said um I don't know anyone actually I've just come back to Australia uh, can I please just hang out with you? And she said, yeah, sure, fine. And she introduced me to some other people that were in the room and that was really lovely. And I, I felt um, very welcomed um, after she introduced me to people. But that first initial shock of walking into a room and just feeling very different and not knowing anyone was very daunting. So um, that person and myself, we kind of met up for like a casual breakfast. And soon after that, we met up with other women um, and said, okay, do you know what, before a conference, let's all just meet up and, um, you know, we can go into the conference kind of together. And that's kind of how we started the AWSN. We started off with just like a casual breakfast just before a security conference. And then we went, do you know what, I'm sure there's other women that are out there in Australia. So we started a LinkedIn group. And very quickly that grew and we started to connect different women that were across the different states. Then we said, okay, well, let's, let's instead of casual breakfast, let's do events. So we started to do monthly events in different states and that's how we organically grew. So now we have um, chapters in each state across Australia. Um, we also have a, a cadet program for helping women that are in security for three years or less. So these include students or people that are transitioning from another area into security or also people that have just you know, started out in security. And what we do is we try to connect those entry level people to each other. So all these uni students that might be alone in their particular course, um, it's really great for them to meet other students. And so then they can then encourage each other and go to conferences together, learn together. Um, and that's been really positive because um, I remember going to a one, one university and that that student was like saying, one of the female students came up to me afterwards and went, oh, thank you so much for coming to talk. Um, I've, I wasn't, I was having doubts about whether or not I should pursue a career in security because I'm the only female student and all my male students are asking me why I sh I'm doing it because I'm a girl. And I was like, okay, we need to do something about this. So um, that's why we started to further develop the Aid of Saint Cadet program. Um, and that's been going on for the last um, four years, which is really great. And now we're diversifying in terms of the things that we're doing. So we partnered with Abby to do the awards um, three years ago, which was really great. Two years ago, sorry. Um, and now the magazine. And uh, now we're launching a, a mentoring program and also some women in leadership training. So we've just started to, we started as a kind of casual LinkedIn group. And now we've turned into, uh, you know, an, an association, which is, was, which is really great. That's super cool to hear. Uh, there's a book that I'm reading right now that's almost done, that I'm almost finished. It's called The $100 Startup. And it's this New York Times bestseller. And it, it basically talks about 
how uh, entrepreneurs can remove barriers to achieve things by just doing the thing. And a lot of people sometimes wind up creating something not even like they set out to. It's just all of a sudden it just happened. And that's kind of the story that you just told, Jackie, where you were at an event. You're like, well, I have a thing that I want this to be different for me. And then it grew into this much bigger thing. And, you know, Abby, to hear you talk about the way that you overcame uh, you know, the fear that you had about, you know, making this, this big contribution. And here you are, the two of you making such an impact, um, that I, who live like th tens of thousands of miles away from you heard about what you're up to. And I'm like, I need to meet these people. So kudos to both of you. It's, uh, it's working. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's, um, let's, let's dive into this first topic that I, uh, teed up a moment ago and talk about like, why this matters. And the reason that I think this is an important question is because um, I think that everybody knows that this matters instinctively. But we also need to, like for anything to work in any way, we also need to be able to understand like, well, what's the business reason behind this? And so maybe that's where we can start is to say, okay, we, we accept that this, this is critically important to humanity but what is the reasoning for a business? So, um, okay. So just in regards to that question, why is it important? To be completely honest, why isn't it important? Yeah. So obviously there's millions of, re there's millions of reasons behind it and why it's important for, for different factors. But even just nailing it down to basic neuroscience, men and women think differently. They have key differences in what they pay attention to. They have very different, unique um, perspectives. Um, women are inherently great at driving innovation. They work, tend to work in fast-paced environments. They're compassionate, intuitive, and relate through different forms of um, psychology so they use empathy communication and they're more appreciative of other viewpoints so having women on teams within businesses can actually help improve your team processes boost different group collaboration and create a more well-rounded workforce um, their different perspectives well our different perspectives come from a different way of living, a lived experience that allow us to gain from the different choices um, and the knowledge that we can gain from that to deliver the unique perspectives um, against different potential issues, threats, and solutions within our roles. So it is the same for every single industry. It just seems to be that the percentages seem to be very low when it comes to IT security. So there is a real business benefit to having diversity on a team, bringing a different, fresh approach in order to look at the same problem in a new way. Um, and it is just good for business. There are metrics out there that prove that there is a business case. You look at different reports from PwC, McKinsey and MSCI, they all show that having a diverse workforce increases productivity, profitability, and a company's reputation when it comes to recruitment. So it is important. Everyone does already know about it. But I think the education just needs to keep going out there and being pushed to the industry. Yeah, and I have to say... Point. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Jackie. And I have to say that I love the, the questions that I'm getting from companies has changed. It's not about, okay, why is diversity important? It's okay. I don't have any females in my team. How do I get more females in my team? And I think that's really refreshing after, you know, just a few years, instead of me being asked to go on panels, why is diversity important? It's actually, how do we actually fix this problem? So I think that there definitely has been a shift. People understand that diversity is important. Um, and as Abby was mentioning, you know, it is good for business. Like if we think about um, the population, 50% of us are female. So, you know, when it comes to um, product development or, you know, human-centered design, you need to have women at the table as well because you are 
selling to half the population or you are trying to produce a a service which needs to be um, okay for females as well. So there definitely is um, a real business need to be able to, you know, to to include women at the table. And um, I agree also with Abby in the fact that, you know, this is not just a, a problem for information security. It's, it is a, I think a lot of these issues that we'll be talking about today is for any, a, a lot of the um, groups that, you know, there's low numbers of females in those occupations. Um, technology seems to be a big one. And even within technology, security is even smaller. So that's why this particular um, area is why Abby and I are so focused on it. Um, because if we can solve it within our particular industry, who are actually wanting to make a change, then we can make a bigger impact rather than trying to solve it for all of tech or all of STEM. That's a, a fascinating approach to solving the problem. Focus on a, on a specific area, especially an area that is in the most need, and then broaden it out from there. And I'm so happy to hear what you just described, Jackie, that um, that the, the tone of the questions are shifting. I already, I, I totally agree with you. I already see the business case for diversity. And the reason I was asking that question was not because I didn't necessarily understand, but because I thought it was really important that we start there as a foundation and you guys made such a good uh, explanation for it. So if we can all agree, which definitely the three of us agree, and I would imagine that a the majority, if not 100% of our listeners would agree that this is, um, that there's such a compelling business case for this. Why does this issue continue to exist? Why are there not enough uh, women in security? So I think it's perception. Um, a, there's a lot of perception and stereotyping that if you want to pursue a career in security, you need to be technical you need to wear a hoodie. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's a level of, uh, you know, coding that's involved, um, that you need to be a hacker, that you need to know how to pen test. And that stems from a lot of the perception in, you know, for example, movies and um, what we know about security. It, it sounds really scary and very technical. Um, as many people know, you know, security is extremely broad um, in terms of the areas and the domains that you can work on in security. I, f I feel that, yeah, a, a level of technical expertise is definitely needed and background, but you don't need to be on the computer all the time, pen testing and, and um, programming the whole time. Um, so, I think the other issue is that we're losing a lot of them at high school. This is the whole STEM tech issue as well. Uh, the fact that a lot of them are, we, we're losing them because I remember speaking to a high school girl at one of the career fairs and she was like, I said, oh, so you thought about, you know, going to a career in security or in IT? And she went, well, I use my phone, I use my technology every day, but I'd never work in it. It's not very cool. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, there's definitely a perception issue that, you know, it's not cool to, to work in, in security yet. Um, and we need to kind of change that perception at that really, really young age. The other thing I think is there's, a, there's, not so, there's not an awareness of what's out there. So as I mentioned, you know, it's very broad in terms of the types of careers that you can, can pursue in cybersecurity. And I think that we don't do a good enough job of showing that diversity. So that's why the magazine's really important. That's why the awards are really important. It's why um, us getting people to speak at events about different careers is really important. And getting to people at the younger ages and um, to show them, you know, these are the different kinds of careers. There are women that are out there. Um, you know, that whole saying that you, you can't be what you can't see is very true. Um, a lot of those university students were like, oh, I didn't know that you could, you know, be a lawyer and be in security. I didn't know that you could have a marketing degree and work in security, awareness and culture. Um, and that awareness of those different diverse um, areas that you can go into, I think, needs to be kind of worked on. The other thing is culture. So this is where you know, we're losing some of the women that are currently in security. So there are some 
companies where the culture is quite toxic um, and not very welcoming for women that are working in security. Very early on when we started the AWSN, you know, there was a lot of women that would confide in me to say that, you know, they were in a, a not a very welcoming environment um, and they felt like that they were trapped there. They didn't think that there was anything that they could actually do and they thought that that was what the industry was like. So the good thing for them was meeting other women that were in other companies to actually hear about, you know, how they were thriving or how they were doing gave them the motivation to, you know, make that move um, and to stay because that's the thing. If we, if you are in one um, bad company and you think that's how the whole industry is and you don't get exposure to other companies or other people, then that can, that's how we can, can lose people. So I think that whole toxic, knowing where those toxic companies are and knowing when it's not a great place to work and moving is, is, is important. Um, and job ads as well. You know, there's a lot of bias in a lot of those job ads. So um, as females, I know that I've done the same. Like when there, there's a job ad that comes up, I have a look at it and go, oh, I don't do that one thing. No, can't apply for it. Um, I rem- I, there was one job that I went for, which was um, the title was the D- director of cybercrime. And I went, oh, my God, that sounds so cool. I definitely want to go for that. Um, and when I was looking through the criteria and I spoke to a, a colleague of mine, he said, oh, no, 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 you can't go for that. You don't do that, 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 that. And I was like, going, but it sounds so cool. I'm going to go for it anyway. <laughs> um, and I did and I got it. And I love that job. It was one of my you know, favorite jobs that I actually worked on. But, you know, a lot of those job ads, they have a laundry list of things. And yes, you may want those kind of people or that skill set and those competencies, but um, just remember that um, it may be isolating certain people because they may not want to apply for it due to confidence or not thinking that they can go for that role. Um, And so, you know, making sure that you have a look at the language when it comes to job ads and reach out to certain people that you think might be really great for the role can really help with that as well. That's a pretty cool uh, insight. That, I mean, a lot of what you said is, is cool insights, but the one part that you just mentioned, literally today at our company, we had a, um, we're having an internal discussion actually about this exact topic. And um, we were talking about, well, how do we, how do we address that problem where if there's 10 bullet points and the way that men are wired and the way that women are wired, the, the research seems to show that men might look at it and say, well, I only have four of these bullet points, so that's good enough. I'll go for it. And, uh, and of course, we're generalizing here, but and women might say, well, I only have nine. I don't have the 10th, so I won't. And so we're saying, well, wow, does that mean that we're potentially losing good candidates because we have more than one bullet point? And so we're actively right now thinking about well, how do we do that? And maybe one of the ideas is, you know, maybe something like the bullet points are, hey, if you meet, you know, five out of these eight apply, and then hopefully that eradicates some of the, you know, the issues that you're uh, alluding to. So yeah, definitely that's, that's a really good um, observation. Um, but not you, Abby, what do you think? Uh, well, Jackie pretty much nailed it on her on her response but just on your just on what you said then you know within your own within the conversation that you've had today changing that job ad changing the language within the job ad and maybe don't make the job ad so technical because there's a lot of women that will look at these job ads that are very highly qualified that can do the job but they're just not from a non-technical background so offer them different choices in regards to training and development, because we're fast learners. We can get there, but you need to actually put that in a job spec. Um, so that's, you know, that's what I would say in regards to, to your internal conversation is that that is ultimately what needs to happen. Those job specs do need to change. Businesses do need to change their job ads, and they need to actually look at different ways to broaden their career pools and, and and who they can who their prospects are in regards to generating um, more women into the industry. 
Exactly. And, it, and it's, it's more about competencies um, rather than, okay, you need to have background in this particular firewall or, you know, <laughs> um, right. technology. Because, I mean, if you say have, you know, firewall management uh, security experience or something like that, then that opens up a whole lot of different people. People can learn, like, you can then learn how to do it specifically for that particular platform or technology. Um, so I think taking the technology words out of it can really um, help and open those doors as well. Yep. So we've talked a lot today about uh, some of these barriers that exist, certainly job ads being, uh, being one of those issues and many of the other things you guys enumerated. So how do we overcome these barriers? So I think that this need this stems from a very young age. Um, I saw it even with my young kids. Um, you know, when you're handed a present, the boys get Lego, they get robots, they get all these toys that encourage them to, you know, work with things and and improve their kind of logic and stuff. Um, and I realized that all the the girls they get dolls and they get you know um things for you know tea sets etc and you sit there going okay well that already starts at a very young age the encouraging thing is that i've seen now dolls that have like scientists and you know the books are now becoming a lot um more diverse in in the language and the stereotypes that they write in it um i remember reading a book to my my son that um that I had um, when I was young and the stereotypes in that was incredible. I was like, wow, you can't say that in this day and age. Um, and I think that the language is changing now in, in the books that we read to our children, which is going to help a lot, I think. And we need to continue with that to show, you know, have in the book show that, you know, mum or dad can be whatever they want as opposed to, you know, dad is going to be a doctor and, you know, mum's going to be, you know, in a nurse or things like that, that largely make, gives the stigma that, you know, that is a, a, a male job and this is a female job. I think that that needs to change and that is slowly starting to change, which is great. Um, and then learning what the different careers are. So I feel that we need to really make this change in high school. So like year seven and eight, that's when people are influenced as to what they want to be. They, they have to make that choice already, whether, okay, I want to go down the science career or I want to go down the arts career. Um, and if we don't expose them to, this is what it's like to be in technology or in security at that early age, they're not even going to consider it. Um, and they they won't want to then go on to university and potentially take that career path. I think that it's great that we're starting to see a lot more coding camps. So a lot of organisations have been pushing for a lot of that, which is really helping. And um, you can see that that has made a massive difference. Like there are more women that are coding now. Um, and I think that it's thank largely thanks to those programs out there that are encouraging young girls to, to have a love for coding. We need to do something similar, I think, for, you know, security. There are programs out there, especially in the Australia, the ACA have have rolled out the, the, the cyber security challenges, which makes the kind of like fun challenges that high school students can, can do. And it, it's great to see that the participation of women are increasing in that as well, which is really great because it gives them an idea of, okay, this is what it's like to work in security, um, and, but it also teaches them the importance of security as well, which I think is a, is, is a double um, b benefit. So learning about, okay, this is why security is important, but also, hey, how about considering a career in security is really important. Um, so that's, I think it's the starting at the young age, which is really important, but it's also encouraging companies to be more flexible with their, with their employees and equal pay. So when it comes to, and I think that we've made some progress in this, a lot of the large company, like when I was in France and that, that was, sorry, France, French listeners, if there are any French listeners, but um, when it came to flexible working, um, you know, a lot of the women went back to work at three months. Um, uh, and I, I 
when I asked for extended maternity leave, they were looking at me like, oh, wow, really? Do you want to wow. do eight months? And I went, yes, no, I do. I want to definitely stay with my child and then I want to be part-time. And they went, part-time? We don't even have any in the system. <laughs> so, you know, it, um, you know, it's a different culture shift. Here in Australia, I think that we are really great with that. We have, you know, it's accepted as a culture to that you take a year off of maternity leave and then um, work part-time. However, when it comes to security, I think those part-time jobs are, f- are not so um, common. I've been very lucky that I've been able to work part-time in all kinds of different schemes. So I'm going to do a real put like a, um, a promotion for job sharing. I did job sharing and job sharing was fantastic. Like um, I got promoted into a job share role at a big bank and that was fantastic. Like, um, you know, I know that I was a very, I was very lucky. I was with a job share partner who was brilliant. So the great thing about job sharing is that you get 40 years experience in one person. Like the girl that I job shared with, she had a background of marketing, psychology, and I had the technical background. So together we were a fantastic team because we really complemented each other. And it meant that we really did work the, th- the three days um, and it allowed us to actually have time with our family, but also to work, um, you know, in, in, in security in our roles. So I think that companies need to look more at those flexible working schemes in order to retain, you know, really great talent and great women that are in our industry because we do lose them because they think that they don't have a choice, that they have to stay home and, and look after the family because they can't work um, as well as look after the family. Yeah, and I think just to, just to add on that, um, clearly within schools, the message is men are better at tech than females are. Um, I know that from having two girls and one boy in my household. My girls, I was insistent that they needed to do some kind of technology, STEM class or security class. But the school teacher that was actually um, teaching that, he was the nerdy uncool teacher that no one wanted to be in that classroom. It was really uncool and it was boring. Um, On top of that, I had my son in another room playing video games and uh, watching movies and it really, re- those really reinforced the stereotypes that we actually have still today in tech um, and also in cybersecurity. Look at the hacker movies. They're all men. <laughs> and like Jackie said, they're either in hoodies or in suits walking into big buildings and organizations trying to hack someone. So are we actually really surprised that it's the majority of men dominating the industry. So um, as mentioned already, the only way to actually change that and to change the industry is to remove the gender bias stereotypes. And as I've learned very recently, which, you know, coming from a family, my upbringing and a family of three kids, um, two girls, one boy, colour is very important. And I just learned a very valuable lesson by issuing... Um, the first issue of Women in Security magazine with a pink cover. Um, And I did that not because of pink is girls at the moment, Um, it might not be tomorrow, and blue is boy. It's all down to the fact that that was what looked best with the illustration that we had on the front cover. It was also a mixture of both my logo for Women in Security magazine and the AWSN logo. Um, And it was a mixture of everything. So I think we need to change um, the different messaging that we have out there, including colour, imagery for cybersecurity, um, no hoodies, um, job specs, descriptions, and the language used within them that we've already brought up. And within the organisations themselves, we need to remove the barriers of the unconscious gender bias in the workplace. People say they don't have it, but... You do. It is there. I think everybody has it. Um, there aren't enough mentors 
um, in the in the industry to bring these young females up through um, the organization into different leadership roles and tell them what's what's going to benefit them, what's not going to benefit them, and how to get to that next step. Um, flexibility as well. You know, men are seen as having to have the full-time jobs. And Jackie actually nailed it there where, I mean, she wants to do um, work share and part-time and all those different things, but why can't the men do that? And why can't the women um, be there and have the flexibility within the office to do full-time? So it's kind of, it kind of works in, in uh, both ways for men and for women. Businesses just need to be more flexible um in in their job in their job roles um percent abby yeah until we actually have men that are doing um flexible working it there's no choice for the women that might want to work full-time you're right yeah i mean you look at how hard it is to get men to have paternity leave It, Mm. it, it is it is a perfect example of different roles within the business and also the unequal growth opportunities for women compared to men, that is not going to change until the business has changed. That isn't something that that we as women can actually enforce. The businesses have to enforce that and try and make that more equal um, when it comes to growth opportunities within businesses. Um, and I think that I think the last one is that even though businesses find this part really really hard. It's not that hard because I know for a fact, especially in the Australian well, ANZ market, there are so many women out there um, that you can attract within different leadership roles, security roles, different business roles, awareness roles, risk and management, um, resilience. They are there. It's just that no one knows really about them. And because of the job specs, that these women aren't actually applying for anything. Um, so I think that we need to change the way that businesses attract women within their business. Um, and like I said, we are moving in the right direction. Jackie's already said it. Um, nominations for the Women in Security Awards last year pretty much doubled. Well, actually, it tripled. Um, and I can see that happening year on year. So it's allowing us to elevate more women within the market. Men are elevating more women in the market, which is amazing to see. Um, and all we need now is the businesses behind these initiatives and behind AWSN and behind the initiatives that I'm working on to basically challenge the culture from within and not make it end up just being noise and us screaming from the rooftops all the time. Um, so I think you to remove those barriers, that's what you've got to do. And, and you know what? We have actually had those barriers. They've existed since World War II. So when I've been doing my research on gender biases recently, I've been looking at where, where this actually came from. Like, why are we like we are? And it does actually stem from prior to World War II. Um, so to be fair, I don't think it, like the, the whole bias is je- deeply entrenched within businesses anyway. So to remove those, we've got to break those stereotypes and encourage more women into the IT security field. And I think AWSN holds that um, in, that is their, that is their core mission. Um, and I think that we need to actually, there's a lot of different organizations um, around the globe that are actually doing the, the, same, the same thing, um, trying to elevate these women into the industry so that we can actually create a different culture um, within businesses. Oh, and, and, Go ahead. and just to add to that, I think that it's, vital to do that now um especially during this COVID time there has been a lot of you know people working from home and homeschooling in australia which has really hurt a lot of people (laughs) um that's been quite painful and you know some studies have actually been coming out saying that you know all the work that you know 
a lot of these organisations like ourselves have been doing over the past 25 years may be wiped out if we don't do something now because a lot of the time um, it's the female that seems to take a lot of the, the, the you know, homeschooling and the family life um, and we just need to try to, you know, just pay attention to that and make sure that, that all the work that has been made over the last 25 years isn't um <laughs> do it or lose it right yeah do it or lose it yeah yeah awesome well those are those are really great insights all around for sure uh so as we wrap up on time here and man i could i could talk to the two of you guys for the next 17 hours straight but we can't uh, <laughs> so if, if we were going to leave um with just maybe maybe one idea here what should there have been so many ideas that you've all shared. And so maybe this is even just a restatement of something that you've already said, but for the men who are listening to this um, show right now, many of whom are in leadership positions and, and can actually go implement change at their organization, but also including men who maybe aren't in a leadership position, but just in the way they go about their daily role, what would be a piece of advice for what uh, men can do in order to better champion um, the you know, women in security? So for men and women day to day, I think one thing that can really make a difference is that if you see somebody that has potential, you reach out and actually offer help. So that's either mentoring or it might be to um, put them on some training or simply when you're in a meeting and they uh, have a really great idea and they're trying to articulate it, but they're not quite getting heard to reiterate what they're saying and say the language, oh, I, I agree with you, um, you know, Jane or whoever it is, um, you know, that idea that you just said about blah, 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 blah is really great and this is how we can do it, to, to really kind of mirror what they're saying because sometimes it can be really difficult to be heard in the room and to actually just do that, that small thing not only helps with the confidence of that person, but it also helps them to get heard and their ideas. Um, and I think from my perspective, we really need to ask men to champion us and be our allies rather than try and alienate them. Um, as an industry, we need to actively seek to hire, retain, and promote women in all levels of the business. Um, and, and yeah, so at the end of the day, I mean, there's, there's, there is so much research behind it. There is The businesses already know this. Having a diverse workforce is just great for business. It increases so many different things. Um, but the fact that Jackie mentioned... 50% of the population is men, but saying that, there are more men um, in the Fortune 500 companies at board level than there are females at approximately 77%. Why wouldn't we get men to champion us and act as our allies? Um, and as an industry, I think that we need to do that and move forward with that. And I think that we're doing really well so far. Our male champions have changed, changed dramatically last year the first year um we ran the women in security awards we had i think five or six men um pushed forward for that award last year as jackie would know we had 38 men that pu were pushed forward as male champions so to actually go from six to 38 in one year was huge so we're already we're we're already getting there we're doing the work um, we just need to do more and we need to be more aware and we need to, it's all about attracting, retaining and promoting and getting that message right within the market. So that's, that's what I would say. <laughs> well, that's uh, what a wonderful sentiment to, to end on all the, the actionable advice that both of you have given today. You're, you have been tremendous guests. I think the ideas and the advice that you've shared today are really going to help people. And I'm such a big supporter of what you're both up to. So um, thank you both for joining us here today. Thanks so Thanks much. For having us. Thank <laughs> of you. Course.
And for everyone listening, if you want to learn more about the show or uh, request to appear as a guest yourself, just go to tedharrington.com backslash podcast and we will catch you next time. Mm -hmm.